Good morning, happy Sabbath. Or two of my brothers and sisters in Thailand, Suksan Wan Sabado Nakrab. My name is Pastor Ernesto Douglas Venn, and it's an honor to be here with you and to help keep this focus on bringing hope and healing to our cities. I serve and coordinate the Mission to the Cities initiative of the World Adventist family, and we're going to he- be excited. I'm, I'm excited about the stories that you get to hear and as we highlight. Uh, from around the world of how health and healing is bringing hope to families and changing communities, neighborhoods, and lives. When I was in Bangkok, Thailand, serving there as a uh, missionary, I remember uh, meeting with one group of community leaders, and we offered our services as a Seventh-day Adventist church uh, to that community there in Tonbury. And in that situation, we asked uh, the, the elected officials, how can we serve this neighborhood? of over 100,000 people. And they said, you Adventists have an advantage. You can help us by serving with health. So can you come and train our health advocates, our health educators in our community? And so it was thrilling to see from Bangkok, the streets there, or from the streets of Karachi, or from Manila, to see during that time of how we as a people of hope, transformed by God's grace, can actually bring this message and actually change lives and people. We are motivated by the hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ. As we look forward, covered by his righteousness, his grace, we look forward to the judgment day when we know all things will be made right and when at his uh, soon return. Have we tasted this hope? Have we been transformed by this hope in a way that can bless others? Because as a people of hope, that's we can be infectious and spread this hope to prepare not only our own families, our own faith families, our churches around the world, but also our cities as a people of hope. I'd like to invite uh, my good friend, Josue Orellana, to come here at this time to actually share some stories and to tell us more about how ADRA is bringing hope and healing. So Dr. Orellana, Dr. Josue, tell us, what is ADRA? Thank you. Well, the Adventist Development Relief Agency is the official agency of the Adventist Church to promote community development and humanitarian aid. Okay, so bringing hope in practical ways to those areas that are least uh, developed or hit by disasters. That's awesome. So with that, I know that you have a new initiative, a new program. Can you tell us about that? Okay, so I'd like to show you on the screen, if you can go to the third, second slide. So ADRA's collective focus is on health, nutrition, water and sanitation, on livelihoods, education, and emergency management. Can we go to the next slide? So ADRA has decided to focus on non-communicable diseases to bring hope and healing mm-hmm. to people who need it, especially in peri-urban areas as well as rural areas, because many developing countries are now having a double burden of disease. So this is a really important fact for us to tackle. Right. And so with this new uh, 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 initiative called uh, Live More Abundantly, can you tell us about that? Of course. So we started in the Pacific, in the South Pacific, uh, at Australia leading the process of creating an approach, which now we call it Live More Abundantly, that is to promote healthy lifestyle. But it's this basically customized for low-income settings mm. to reach those peri-urban areas of many developing countries. We go through 13 sessions within one month, and then it continues for two more months, weekly sessions, and then finally, uh, one meeting every month. All right. So how is uh, Live More Abundantly, how is that uh, helping people uh, in the uh, urban context? So is there a way that, um, do you have a story that you'd like to share? Of course. Can we go to the last slide? So you can see this gentleman here. He lives in one of the islands in the South Pacific. He joined the program. Mm -hmm. And as you can see his testimony, after five days of practicing the new habits, he started to see changes in his life, losing weight. He's a fisherman, so he needs to dive. And he said, even within five days, I could feel myself that I could dive deeper and stay longer there 
that means bigger and greater livelihood even for his family. Wow, that's great. It's an awesome to hear on how uh, through this program you're bringing hope and healing and bringing uh, to those communities. Where else are you uh, working with this, uh, these pilot projects? I know I had a chance to hear some of those stories, but what other nations are you using this uh, Live More Abundantly? Well, we started in several islands in South okay. Pacific. Then we extended it to Asia, to Cambodia, Thailand, Nepal. And now we extended it to Africa. So we are starting in Zimbabwe. We expect to extend it to more countries in Africa and soon to Latin America as well. Very good. And so how can people uh, learn more about this uh, initiative? Well, I would like to invite everybody to join us, to support us, to work together. Here there is an email address. You can reach out to us and we can get engaged. Very good. Well, thank you, Josue. Any uh, other things you'd like to share as you close? Well, we believe that uh, by following Christ's method, by mingling with people, by ministering to their needs, we can really show to them that we really truly care about them mm -hmm. and about their needs. Very good. Thank you so much, Josue. Isn't it exciting, uh, family, to hear on how ADRA is actually making an impact uh, addressing the lifestyle diseases uh, around the world? So. That was thrilling. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Linda Koh and uh, Dr. Sostan uh, Mufune uh, to hear, and they're serving as the uh, directors of the uh, Children's Ministry Department for the Adventist Church at the General Conference. And so, uh, Dr. Linda and uh, Sostan, welcome. Thank you. And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So, how do you guys give the Sabbath greeting uh, in your language where you guys are from? Anshiru Kwaila. Okay. Sabat alawino. Okay, very good. So, thank you. Tell us, with children's ministry, how are you mobilizing the family worldwide to uh, the Advanced family to actually bring hope and healing to the children in our cities? Uh, besides just organizing our programs, we also develop many resources to try to reach the kids in the city. So, one of the things that we have done is uh, developing uh, DVDs, animated DVDs, to teach. Uh, about health, celebrations. So our latest uh, product that have just come out from Pacific Press uh, just last month is Say No to Drugs, All which right. is an animated... Uh, and it's produced uh, by my very gifted uh, musical uh, associate, Dr. Mufuni, who is very... He loves music and loves children. Yeah. So he has written all the songs and also the whole drama, which is... Uh, so we hope that it can reach many children because today children are technologically very oriented to it. Yeah. Yeah. So how can people uh, who are uh, interested, how can they avail of this new well, resource? Well, uh, many of them, uh, we send them out free to our division directors and they you know, dispense them out to the unions all the way to the local churches. And uh, also they are being sold by Pacific Press in the local ABCs. Okay, yeah. very good. Thank but you. if they write to our office, we're happy to all share right. them. We cover different issues in this DVD. Why children are tempted to use drugs, peer pressure, divorce, environment. We are going to show you a clip now where I talk about low self-esteem. Why many kids use drugs. They used to call me shorty, shorty. They teased me all of the time. They used to call me shorty, shorty. Everywhere I went, I really didn't like it. I would boil up inside, but I could not change the way that God made me so shorty.
That's great. Just a... So what was in your heart um, as you guys produced this? You know, what, what, what do you want uh, the world family to know about, you know, your contribution for mission and to reach the, ki- uh, the kids of the city? Uh, for us, we believe that once children are motivated, mm-hmm. they are happy of who they are, right. they can do a lot for Jesus. Because all of us, our hope, is in the second coming of Jesus. So That's our right. job is to inspire children that it doesn't matter what you are going through. It doesn't matter how you look like. It doesn't matter how shorty, short you are. <laughs> you are still made in the image of God. That's right. That's right. And I know that uh, the, these addictions and uh, are coming at such a young age, and it's so uh, great to see on how you are uh, making this resource and to help inspire and uh, our uh, world family with children's ministries to help address the temperance uh, needs from around the world. And uh, right now, what languages in the future are you planning to, uh, is this a t- tool available in? Uh, right now, the first one we produced was uh, two years ago, is okay. Celebrations. And that is in, in line with the uh, program from Health Ministries. Right. So uh, different countries have taken that and they, uh, we have given a files out to everyone who, who choose to, uh, the division who wants to de- translate them. And also that's what we hope to do, that they can either put a subtitle or they try to dub it. Okay. And, yeah. and but the songs are uh, kind. So some of them, I'm surprised, they have just taken this song and translated it into the Croatian language. Awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. just beautiful to see. So we can go ahead. We usually send out the files to help so okay. that they can have access to every, all the children around Very the world. good. So yeah. uh, thank you so much thank for sharing uh, on how you are helping to, the kids to have hope and healing and, uh, and preparation for Christ's soon return. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite our next uh, team here, and we're going to hear uh, from uh, different um, individuals on how we are working the cities around the planet. And uh, we're honored to have um, uh, this group here. And so, Cherie Peters, what an awesome time to be here. Can you imagine you being here? I can't even imagine being here. I am so thrilled. Well, Cherie, can you tell us right now, as um, w- during our workshop, as we were looking at the community uh, ways uh, to actually help address uh, the uh, um, behavioral addictions, can you tell us a story? I want to tell you a story. First of all, um, I want to say thank you, because I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for the Adventist and the Health Message. Wow, I was homeless God. in Los Angeles for 10 years as a child, and so that's where I came from. I got stuck. I thought, with a vegan, vegetarian, Seventh-day Adventist. (laughs) I thought I was in hell, but it actually changed my life. And so what was really interesting to me is she told me, you really need to find a church. You need to go back to school. You need to learn to read. I was functionally illiterate at 23. So I did. I went back to school, um, got a degree. Um, Addictions was what I loved and in mental health because I am crazy. And so it was a perfect fit. But I went back to school and started looking at addictions. And I remember just being overwhelmed by the magnitude of the problem and what happens neurochemically and all that stuff. And so I got into that. And then I started to look up and realize that right now, um, the young people coming up aren't so much addicted to drugs, alcohol, that kind of thing, but they are Well, 48% of the world has an addiction that's so severe that it's changing their neurochemistry, Mm -hmm. and the addiction is our device addictions, right? It's our smartphones and what we, the the way we are utilizing those things. So our behavioral addictions are are are, um, a problem as much as um, any of our chemical addictions. And so the story is, I went to a elementary school in the Adventist system. I'm a speaker. I have a television show called Celebrating Life on 3ABN. And so I went to this elementary school. And at the end, the principal said, why haven't you talked about drugs? And I'm looking at these cute little kids. And I'm thinking, okay, let me just do a survey. To this group, raise your hand if you're a heroin addict. I'm not seeing any hands. (laughs) Raise your hand if you smoke pot. 
Well, don't do that because you'll call yourself out. But, you know, raise your hand if you're, and I said this to all these kids about a various number of addictions. They didn't raise their hands, but raise your hand if you question whether you might be addicted to gaming, smartphones, your, your devices, and all their hands went up. Raise mm -hmm. your hands if you feel suicidal. Raise mm -hmm. your hands if you deal with depression or anxiety. And so we really focus on that. So I think as a church, what I wanna say here, because I love this church, I Amen. love you guys. Amen. But right now, if 48% of the population is getting lost in behavioral addictions, and we have a health message trying to get them to get outside and move, man, mm -hmm. Um, we, we are going to be the answer to that. Praise God. Thank you, Sheree, for sharing this story. Let's hear from Dr. John and about the pastor-physician uh, partnership. Can you share a story? Certainly. I'd like to tell you a story about Christine. Uh, Christine was a person that was introduced to me uh, at a health program. Uh, she came to a church health program, and when she came, she felt terrible. Hmm. Her health was in terrible condition. She was introduced to me uh, by our uh, gospel workers. And as she continued in her health program, her health dramatically improved. You actually saw that she was enjoying life. She had joy and happiness in her life. And it seemed to be changing her whole countenance right before our very eyes. Now, Christine was not a spiritual person. She didn't have any faith that she followed. Um, and, and, and at the very best, she was probably indifferent to religion. And at the worst, she was actually a little afraid to be inside a Seventh-day Adventist church. Mm. Um, but she was befriended by those that were in the class that she was in. She felt so much better. Uh, the pastor came alongside as well as ever, uh, other uh, church members. And after our health program was over, she continued to come to worship with us. And she came week to week. Uh, uh, for months, she would worship with us. And I remember one uh, Sabbath afternoon, uh, Sabbath morning service, she, I saw her in the back and I waved to her to come to the front to sit with my family and I. And we worshiped together for a while. And, and then she leaned over to me and she said something like this, Dr. Dr. Tricuato, I think I need to follow God. Wow. I think I need to follow God. And I said, well, what would make you make that decision? Why would you decide that? And she said something to me that was transformative mm. to realize. She said, Dr. Turquata, it's so clear. The way you people have loved me, mm. I know that it can't be wrong. Amen. Amen. She had made her decision for Jesus. And she continued in that decision. And it wasn't very long before she was actually joining us in health ministries. And I asked her, what is it that brought you you know, into the health ministries. You've got so many other ministries you could participate in. And she said, I want people to know God the way I learned about him wow. through the health message. Hmm. So this is an example of how people that we, I would never have known her if she had not come to a health program and she would never have known me. And yet she's one of my dear friends who we love dearly and has joined us. So Thank you so much for sharing that story. That illustrates, wait, before you go, uh, we have just one more minute here. Tell me about this partnership between uh, the gospel and uh, between uh, healing. The pastor, physician, team, church, and clinic. Can you tell us just uh, uh, briefly, why is that such an engine to, uh, to help uh, people and bring hope like the, in this story? We know that if you separate the work of the gospel from the work of the health message, that the worst of evils comes upon our churches not our clinics, not our hospitals, but our churches. We have that from the prophet. And that when you combine the uh, true healing for the body with true healing for the soul, that is an illustration of the gospel. Mm. And again, this is from the prophet. And so recognizing this, we have worked closely with pastors and physicians trying to team together in health ministries and working in clinics associated with our churches uh, that would be a blessing to the world and yet at the same time help us to get off of our, uh, out of our pews into the world to bless mm. and benefit others in ways we not, otherwise would not. Very good. And I love the part of the story. Who helped select the site of where you started the, the new church and the clinic? Tell me, tell us that story as you're closing. So we uh, approached the mayor of our uh, Spokane and we asked him, is there a way for us to help you? You were just elected. What can we do as Seventh-day Adventists? And he took out a map of the Spokane area and he put his hand over the map uh, in an area that was, that was rife with drugs and rife with abuse and rife with uh, uh, 
of violence, etc. And he says, we have no infrastructure there. We, it's a food desert. We need help there. And in that place is where we planted a church. That's right. To bring hope and healing. Thank you so much, Dr. John, for sharing that inspiring story. <laughs> Dr. Ed Urbina, uh, we're going to hear now. You're a dentist. And right. so tell us, tell us right now, um, how are you bringing hope and healing through your initiative there at the Central California Conference? The ministry and the mission of Life Hope Centers in Central California is dependent upon volunteers. And we purpose to have one third of our volunteer force non-Adventists. And it was under those uh, circumstances that I was delighted to see a whole classroom full of dental assistants come to our dental clinic. And so while we were there, we served and we had a great time. And as we were closing our clinic day and we were serving and cleaning up, the instructor of this dental assisting class approached me and said, you know, do you know the story about Betty? And I said, no, as a matter of fact, I don't. You know, Betty came to your clinic here last year as a patient. Mm -hmm. And she was impacted by the compassion and care that she received, that she purposed in her heart that I want to be a dental assistant and do the same thing and mm -hmm. provide the same care that I received. And so she enrolled in the local dental assisting school and so when we were there that year and she heard that Life Hope Centers was going to be in the community, she insisted that her whole dental assisting class, along with her instructor, participate in the program. And so we see an example of a, an individual that came in as a patient and is now serving as a volunteer, one that has now hope and purpose. Mm. Another individual that we had and while we were serving in the Bay Area was a dentist, a Syrian trained dentist. And so she came across a flyer for Life Hope Centers in her condominium. And so out of curiosity, she came over to the clinic and asked how she could help. And so we said, you know, we would be delighted to have you join and help with us. So she served as a dental assistant. She was so excited about what was happening that she called husband who is a software engineer in Silicon Valley and said you have to come over here mm. he came over and we were able to serve him with dental services as well mm. subsequent to that she emailed me and I said I had such a wonderful time I want to be a part of this and so she has been wow. a faithful participant in Life Hope Centers also inviting some of her Syrian colleagues who are physicians and so the last email I got from Jasmine was that she said, Dr. Rabina, I am interested in, in establishing my license here for the United States, and I have discovered that your school, Loma Linda University, provides an international training program for dentists. And I also realize that it is a spiritual school. I intend applying for the program wow. there. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Ed Urbina. So before uh, I forgot to ask, tell me, with this, uh, this initiative that uh, Life Hope Centers w that you're doing in the region of uh, Central California, what, describe what that is. You're doing a you know, mobile and portable dental, and uh, tell right. us about our, that. Our program is unique in that we have a mobile, portable a dental clinic, a 10-chair clinic that we take to various sites. We purposely set up our clinic sites with the church so that we associate the care that the community receives with the local church. And so it also gives us the flexibility to adapt our clinic size based on the facility size site. And so it's, it's a program that provides free dental care free vision care and medical screening. Very good. And tell us about your schedule. Is this something you're doing once a year, once a quarter? You know, the, the demand for dental services and vision services are tremendous because of our, the way our health system is set up. And so we're doing a Life Hope Centers clinic program every other week. We are currently booked completely all the way through 2021. Wow, that's amazing to hear how dentists and working together are, and using health and healing, working with churches and faith communities to actually impact the lives of those many cities in your region. Thank you so much for sharing. Camilla, you're from Sydney, Australia. Yay, welcome. <laughs> that's right. Originally from Brazil, um, myself and my husband, we used to work in investment banking, and we decided that we wanted to invest in the best most valuable asset that we have, people. And we were invited after going to Rise Australia 
to be part of the North New South Wales Conference and minister to the cities, and especially for the young professionals and young families. How are you doing that? Oh, we're very excited. We arrived in Newcastle, where we're placed, um, uh, a little bit, a couple, uh, an hour and a half from Sydney, and uh, where a lot of the young families and young professionals are actually moving to establish themselves. And we started a program um, that involves, uh, um, it's like centers of interest. Mm -hmm. We decided that we didn't have a lot of money, we didn't have a building, so we wanted people of influence in the city. Right. And so we, we have um, a, a, ministries, a ministry called Seeds Newcastle that is attached to our church plants, that is a yeah. house church. And I just want to share a story Please. of Erica. Um, there are many people that will come to our programs um, basically, we started advertising through meetup.com, Facebook events, uh, Eventbrite. And Erica is a, a girl who lives in Sydney, and she's been working in Newcastle during the week. And she was looking for some friends from community, and she saw that we were advertising for a cooking class, because we're advertising for cooking classes, walking groups, um, climbing, hiking, all sorts of things that people can sign up to and come and join. And so Erica signed up and she was actually part of one of the very first cooking classes that we held at my house. Wow. We didn't have a place, but we did it at our own house. And she came. So this is um, Erica in the photo. She's actually on a sourdough workshop. And this is Erica and her husband. After a while that she started attending more of our workshops, she enjoyed. She made friends with people from our church, some Bible workers from Arise that were helping us out just to make friends in the community. And she joined her family to do mission in the city and also overseas. So we, we organized a trip with to Cambodia where people get to go like Erica and share the nutrition values, a, mm. a healthy whole food plant-based diet and help the mothers and the kids and there's Erica there, and she's um, giving workshops to the community um, together with Adra. We did a partnership. Um, Erica now, she's actually one of our volunteers at Seeds mm -hmm. because we cannot do the work by ourselves. But we've been training the people that come to the community to share help and hope in the cities and also globally overseas. And so we thank God for the opportunity that the North New South Wales conference gave us because it has been amazing to see what an interesting uh, people are seeking they're seeking for health and hope and purpose and meaning and God has told us how to do that and it's a, a blessing to be part of this mission beautiful thank you Camilla for sharing that inspiring story from uh, down under there in Sydney and it's been thrilling I've been uh, touched uh, by the stories uh, that have been shown uh, shared today during this segment of mission to the cities because right now sometimes the cities uh, whether it's you're a government official or whether you're a local leader the burden that the non-communicable diseases in the developed world as well as then the burden of the communicable diseases is beyond what one entity can do alone and that's where whether it's the mayor or whether it's you know other uh, county uh, commissioners or even universities or governments we are have this privilege as a people of hope to be infectious and help partner with others like we've heard in these stories thank you so much and uh, it's, I was inspired thank you During this next part, I want to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Zeno Charles Marcel to uh, come forward and uh, share because we as a people of hope have been given instruction to how to work inside the cities, but then we need to have uh, lifestyle centers that are rural based so then that way we can help and uh, t make transforming uh, life changes, whether it's in health or uh, in other aspects of, uh, of shalom or wellness. So Dr. Zeno Charles Marcel, Feliz Salvador, como le va? So, <laughs> okay. Very good. So uh, tell us, what, what are you doing from you know, the World Church family? I know that uh, it's been thrilling to hear the different workshops and plans, but what is the plan for lifestyle centers? Well, what we, what we recognize is that uh, lifestyle centers don't just exist by themselves. They have to be part, excuse me? Yeah, your mic's not working right now, so I think we'll do a, a swap of the baton here. Hello. Yes, 
Yeah, lifestyle centers don't exist just by themselves. Actually, they should be part of the tapestry That's of right. activities that are going on because people have needs in different areas, mm -hmm. right? Um, one, if, if you would allow me to give a little story about, about a, 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 uh, actually about a lady and her husband. This woman uh, with diabetes, I can't show you any pictures because right. she is, uh, because of HIPAA rules, right? right? But she didn't give permission. She didn't give permission. Right. So she, uh, she had diabetes uncontrolled. And her physician said, you know, I think you might need to get some, some help that we cannot give you in the outpatient department. Right. And I don't want you to have to be hospitalized uh, to do this. So I would send you to one of our lifestyle centers, right? So she goes up to the lifestyle center, and her husband decides he will accompany her. He, is, he was, uh, and still is, a commercial real estate uh, uh, agent. And he had been working, like, you know, really hard, and he made this multi-million dollar deal. And he said, I am going to take a few days. I'm going to go with my wife to this uh, health center, all right? So, so uh, she comes as the patient, and he comes as the guest. The cheerleader. The cheerleader. That's right. right. Yeah. And um, so uh, she's checked in and, uh, you know, all the work up and, and so on. And he says, you know, I just want to be able to go around and exercise. I'll eat the food and, and whatnot. But we had a rule. Uh, if you're going to be exercising and doing things here, we need to check you out. All right? So we did. And when we were checking him out, he actually had an acute coronary <laughs> uh, syndrome on the treadmill. Wow. Okay? On the treadmill. Now, this, this was important because, you know, even when we talk about health retreats and so on, we have to be careful that what we're doing is we're not, we're not hurting people. Right. In this particular case, this gentleman, he was going to be at a hotel in Chicago, which is what, what right? Mm -hmm. He was going to get there late. He was going to go to the gym, right. okay? And I know that hotel, okay? And he was going to be alone, yeah. okay? More than likely, he would have died. Wow. Okay. What we did was we resuscitated him there, right? We sent him to the local hospital. Uh, he ended up having uh, coronary angiography and stents being placed. Okay. He went back to his private uh, doctor in the city, and then he came now as a patient wow. in the rural retreat. You see, so so really, the 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 idea is not just doing. A lifestyle center right. is actually having lifestyle centers and different ways of doing mm -hmm. lifestyle uh, intercalated with the other things, the other services that, that we provide, because people have different needs at different times. Yeah. Yes. So w thank you. For, that's an inspiring story. But right now, what are some practical ways? I know that uh, we held this retreat, but there's five different uh, options. Can you talk to us about that? Okay. On, on the slide here, you'll see some of the, uh, the options that are involved. How can you do uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lifestyle retreat? Well, one way is that you can do something that's very simple. On the left, we have church-based uh, wellness activities that mm -hmm. we can do. These are low-level, uh, low-intensity uh, things, okay, right. that, that, that help people to improve their, their health and lifestyle. The next one is home-style lifestyle okay. so retreats. So church, home? Church and home, all right? Mm -hmm. So uh, people can do this in a home-style way, mm -hmm. again, uh, being careful that, that what we're doing is, is on the up and up, right? The next thing is hotel-based. And I, I say hotel-based because some people believe that you have to have uh, uh, a whole facility right. in order to do this. But you don't have to. If you can find a place uh, where you can, uh, you can rent it out or use it for 10 days or two weeks or, or whatever, the length of the program, and you can do this, okay? The, the most important issue is to have personnel, that are trained, who are able to accomplish what it is that we're trying to do with, mm -hmm. in helping people in, in that venue. But I say hotel, but it doesn't have to be a hotel. It could be a school. It Correct. could be a campground. Or it could, it could be, be a, a, a boat, that's a right. cruise ship. That's it right. could be any of, of these things mm -hmm. uh, that you do. It could be uh, cabins that, that uh, uh, a place might have in the country, and you can, you can do that. You can use it uh, for the purposes that we would like but you don't own it necessarily. Right. And then we have uh, wellness centers, which would, would be things that we establish specifically for these kinds of purposes, where we, uh, we take uh, guests and patients in, and we have an established program where we run it all the time, all year long, and so on. And then, of course, we have hospital-based wellness programs where 
in the hospital itself, they may have a wellness program that's, that's being done there. Right. And uh, what we are moving towards is trying to reintegrate right, wellness services into the actual operation of the hospital. And, um, and so this is, this is the kind of stuff that we're doing. Very good. That's so thrilling to hear, to see that uh, just following how Christ worked, he worked in the cities, but then he also had uh, the, the time where he said to his own disciples, come, come apart, apart and come away, as we're dealing with, uh, you know, the traumas uh, that uh, many people face. So what, is, uh, what, what else would you like to say to this group here? Well, you know, we have, we have in the audience actually people who have been involved in things like this. We have mm -hmm. uh, an ongoing uh, project with uh, a group in Guadeloupe, for instance, that have been involved over the last uh, 10, 12 years of taking people from Guadeloupe and from other French-speaking areas to an established lifestyle center that sets aside time for us uh, in Romania called Hergalia. And so we, we go there, uh, the individuals go and we do what is, what is necessary, right, and they go back home. And this this has been going on now for, for many years. Uh, some, as I said, some of the people are here who, who uh, were involved in that project. And we have other projects that are similar. Right. And these things are ongoing and they're producing very good results because we love people and we want them to be uh, to be to prosper and to be in health. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I see here on the slide you have uh, what nine different options. Yeah. You have time to share one more. Okay. Well. Uh, sometimes we can do things in a camp meeting. I remember uh, the first one on the list, uh, they, had, they had a camp meeting and the camp meeting usually runs for a week. Mm -hmm. Well, we said, uh, can we do it a little bit longer? So we took both weekends, right, and we extended the thing sure. to 10 days, okay? And uh, churches actually recommended their pastors ah. to be involved. So right? the pastors need so the, the healing pastors too. the pastors needed the stuff too. Right. And, uh, of course, some of them were very recalcitrant, you know, they, didn't, they thought that this would not, this wouldn't be yeah. uh, very good for them. But it meant that they didn't have to do all of the work of setting up the camp, yeah. okay? So some of them did that because of it. Let me tell you, this transformed, mm. uh, in one conference, it transformed the way they looked at, at even spiritual health, wow. okay? Because uh, the individuals realized that it's not... Uh, the body and the mind are not disconnected, yeah. right? They're actually uh, connected, and it, it actually changed the pastors, and it changed the congregations, and it changed the way that, that they even related to people who were not Seventh-day Adventists, who they love in their neighbors, neighborhoods and their communities. It, it, it changed the fabric of what they were doing. Very good. And if people want to learn more about uh, this, you know, what, how, how can they find out more? Well, they can get in touch with, uh, with our office at the General Conference. They can go to our website. They can leave a note. Uh, and if they want to see me while we're here or see any one of, of, of the team, uh, we will be happy to, uh, to engage them in right. the activities. Well, very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Zeno. Thank you very and much. It's thrilling to see this beautiful connection between the work uh, in the cities, the feeders, the, whether it's a clinic, a hospital, or a home or family, that, and the beautiful referral back and forth, this symbiotic relationship. Or I describe it as an ecosystem that God has given to us as a people of hope to actually help make an impact in every city around the world. So thank you, Dr. Zeno. All right, let's now he, uh, hear from Dr. Katia. Welcome, my sister, Feliz Sábado. Okay, all right, so uh, tell us right now, as uh, I know that uh, all around the world, one of the biggest issues, as we heard from the different plenary speakers, uh, is uh, right now, one of the biggest ones is movement. You realize that? So I'm going to invite the audience right now, as you get started, to stand up, yes. to stand up. And we need to at least uh, do a quick stretch. One of my favorite stretches is starbursts. So if you could reach, extend your arms forward and then start doing this for 10, 15 seconds as fast as you can. And make those twinkle, twinkle little star. Here we go. So Looking Katya. good, looking good. So Katya, what is some of the other biggest uh, issues facing this, the, the cities of our planet that you want to discuss with us today? You know, a major one that many Thank of you, you uh, have heard a lot about this week, and in fact, it was already referred to by some of the guests that you had in the cities, is addictions. It is also at-risk behaviors that lead to death, like suicide um, and uh, gang involvement, violence, 
among youth in particular are young people all over the world. Um, you know, suicide is one of the top leading causes of death. And also, you know, the engagement with addictive uh, behaviors, with violence, with early premature um, a pregnancy, out of, outside marriage, and also all kinds of things that, that really impact life, health, you know, and bring uh, premature mortality. Right. So with that uh, context, so what are we doing about it? Tell us. What, we have a, a wonderful hope, what are we doing? opportunity. There is one particular program that we are working especially to try to reduce some of these at-risk behaviors among uh, particularly this group of young people, uh, teens and uh, young adults. Uh, and this program is called Youth Alive. I'm not sure how many people here have heard of this program. How many? Let me see the hands. Okay. Right. How many Good. people have actually been involved in a Youth Alive program? Yeah, see, this program actually, we as a church have had it for a long time, and many, many uh, countries in the world have made a huge impact in their communities uh, by engaging with the young people, teaching them about healthy behaviors, um, getting them to be connected with each other and um, with adult mentors. Uh, and to make healthier choices. This program has been used for many years, and now recently, just last year, it was kind of like updated uh, mm -hmm. altogether and uh, placed in a digital pl platform, as well as manuals and materials have been in, um, created. And so uh, now it's kind of like a relaunch. Last year we were in Castle together, mm -hmm. along with our youth ministries, leaders from all over the world and that's when this program was launched i wanted to answer your question also by showing this video so you can okay. see some of these at risk behaviors uh, that we are trying to reduce the impact uh, that it has in our young people Sound familiar? Cherie talked about digital addiction earlier. One behavior can lead to a negative behavior. And that's sometimes alcohol can be the door or marijuana can be the door to harder core drugs. But there is hope. Amen? Amen. Youth Alive tries to teach young people that there is a better life to live. You can find joy in relationships can eat healthier, you can lay aside your technological equipment and discover beauty in relationships. You can get out of the house, right? And do what? Movement, oh. exercise, fresh air, sunlight. Connecting with other young people and 
learning more about God and God's purpose for our lives can transform not only individual lives but an entire city. That's right. So this is what Youth Alive is all about. So Katya, right now uh, I'm thrilled about this, but where are we? Uh, where are you about to launch these? So Youth Alive, as I said, has been going on already in many countries, but now with this new relaunch of Youth Alive, we have uh, scheduled several uh, training of facilitators because the way it works, really, we, we do small group, friendship groups that young people can come together with. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of topics that are discussed, activities, fun games, mission and service uh, opportunities. And so uh, we're trying to go train facilitators first so they can know how to use this properly. And we have right now four different uh, scheduled trainings just this year. We're coming to Europe, to the Trans-European Division in the country of Albania. Uh, we're coming Sorry. to Lithuania yep. as well. Uh, in August, and we're gonna come also to the South African Indian Ocean Division in August in the country of Botswana, uh, where all the leaders uh, of these divisions are invited to come to attend in either of those events to be uh, trained. And we are also inviting young people to be there for a conference. After the, the training, there is a youth conference, and, the, and so uh, they'll have the opportunity to do. In December, we're also coming to East Central African Division, and we will be in Tanzania for that uh, Youth Alive. So, and we're scheduling these programs um, so people can be equipped to lead out and teach others and engage them in this. How, how does the Youth Alive uh, initiative, how does that program work? Can you tell us about it? So, Youth Alive, really the essence of it, and um, you know, I'll show this, is based on the i core principles of discipling young people, uh, which actually focuses on building and fostering relationships, relationships to peers, right. to adults, because it's intergenerational uh, mentors that can be there, and also to God. Mm. And so it's all about fostering relationships. It's also about bringing purpose to their lives. So um, it's service. So they have exposure to service activities and uh, mission-related activities. It's also about equipping them for leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, we need young people to be in charge, to be engaged and recognized for the gifts that they have. Right. And, and so... And the mission side is that once the young people experience that community, then they can be contagious and then share that with others, whether at their school, the university, or around the city. That's so, right. That's right. So it goes from that friendship group out into the community. They can invite their friends. They can engage other people and other young people as well in this. It can also be done in schools, by the way, mm -hmm. not only in communities, but many schools use this program with their students beginning of the year, and then all year long, they're able to benefit from this. Uh, and then, again, help kids find their purpose, experience service and mission in a beautiful way, and also have the mentors that can be there to sustain, to advise, to become close to them as they are mentored. We also have a lovely thing, which is we encourage our young people to sign what we call the Youth Alive Pledge. You know, we want them to make a choice to live healthfully mm. and to live an abundant life. And so here's an example of the pledge that they can um, sign at the end of a Youth Alive conference or even through the friendship groups. And it is to pledge to live, as you can see here, a life that is um, abundant life, uh, weight, saying no to drugs, to alcohol, to any kind of process addiction, like we were looking at digital addiction, pornography, or anything like that. And in instead, to spend their recreation time doing fun activities, uh, re relating to others, and doing service activities as well. So this is like at the core that we can help our young people grow themselves in a small group of friends and in a, communi in a community and in an entire city and hopefully in the world. That's right. So we can make an impact. And how can we get, uh, learn more and uh, stay in touch? So, um, as you can see on the screen, we have a website uh, that was developed with this redo of Youth Alive. It's the youthalifeportal.org, and there, there is a whole area just for young people. They can go, there's classes there, free classes, there is um, uh, ways that they can communicate, free books on related interesting topics for young people. There are all kinds of resources for them. And then we also have a Youth Alive portal for leaders where leaders that are here, people that want to lead out on this or, or start this in their community, in their church, in their school, they can sign in and download all of our resources 
Uh, of course, we have the social media there, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. But we, in this portal, um, people can actually go and download our manual. We have a facilitator manual, we have a participant manual, and we have a handbook, which, by the way, all of you here who would like to have the handbook, this is what it looks like. Mm. We have lots of them. We had it in our booth. It's free. If you'd like to know more about the program, you know, uh, in the back, uh, perhaps this afternoon, we can have some of this if you would like, if you did not have a chance to get a man, uh, handbook. And this really explains. We want all the leaders to be involved, and uh, we want to be able to see a change in people's lives. That's what it's, is the core here. And, and how is this uh, resource developed? Oh, it is developed um, both in a collaboration. It's not just health ministries. Right. This is the beauty of this, of this comprehensive health ministry perspective. Mm -hmm. Youth ministries is very much involved. We work together on this. Um, family ministries is very much involved because parents have a huge role right. uh, to, to engage their kids and to know how best to um, foster this kind of resiliency. And also we have uh, schools as part of this, mm -hmm. education. But not only that, this new reiteration of Youth Alive, a major partnership is with Mission. That's right. And so Global Mission is now provided for us also funds and, and this collaboration that we can do pilot projects mm -hmm. around the world to impact communities. And we're very excited about that partnership. That's right. Can you tell us a story of, of how this uh, initiative of actually, how has it changed one person's life? You know, I love the story uh, of Orgil. It's actually Pastor Orgil. He came to a Youth Alive in Mongolia, originally from Mongolia. He was from a Buddhist uh, faith tradition, came with two other friends. They were, at that time, uh, abusive alcohol. They were doing drugs uh, and really living a life, a meaningless life, which he says had no purpose. But they heard about this Youth Alive Congress happening, or it's actually a conference where young people would gather. And he was invited by someone, and he came with his three friends. And this is what he told me when I met him in Castle last year. He said that during those three days at the conference, he felt something different he's never felt before. Hmm. Suddenly, he felt he had purpose in his life. Wow. And he wanted to help other young people. He realized he needed to quit those things, but he didn't know how. But somehow in that conference, he felt strength and an hmm. impression in his heart that there was a God that could help him. That's right. So in that same conference, at the end of those three days, he decided to sign the pledge. No, I don't want to do these things anymore. He decided that he would ask God to help him to quit. And as he did that, uh, he left that conference and his friends committed. He said that they left those behaviors behind. Mm. It was easier than he thought with the help of God. And he decided to get, dedicate his life in service. Mm. He today is a youth leader in his community, in his country, in Mongolia. Mm. And he's also became a pastor. Mm -hmm. And he is now leading other people. He continues doing Youth Alive events there, friendship groups, and now sharing his experience. His three friends also did the same. That's and awesome. they're all uh, ministering, um, you know, to the young people in Mongolia and to other communities as well. They are... Uh, serving and that's what they do. It was a transformation of their life. That's beautiful. So th here we see this one story from one life right now uh, where this initiative of Youth Alive is helping to actually break those addictions. But right now, what about the rest of uh, the World uh, Church family? What are some resources? Can you tell us about Adventist Recovery Ministries? So this is particularly for youth that we were talking right. about, but we have, as you heard yesterday, I mentioned about uh, Adventist Recovery Ministries in the training that we were having here, or Thursday, I, I mentioned it here. It is this ministry that actually is to help people recover for whatever addictions they may have. Any age, any um, uh, way of life, any culture, and we were working with different cultures on this. I wanted to actually ask uh, Dr. Hanaka Tan to come here. She is uh, one of the people that have taken this ministry in the country of the Netherlands. And um, she actually, uh, we went there. We were there, I think it was a couple of years ago. And we did a training. Is that right? It was two years ago. Two years ago. And if we can get her mic going, it would be great. So in two years ago, you had a group of people, beautiful group that came in a trans-European division to the Netherlands. And uh, that's when they got equipped to do this. And in fact, I think we have a picture of the, just the Netherlands group here. 
Not only the Netherlands group, these are the trainers from the Trans-European Division who are allowed to train the facilitators. Okay, so they were there and they were now prepared to start groups. Tell us a little bit about how this has impacted uh, the community there after the training. It was um, a life-changing program. Mm. We had three active groups there and we see some beautiful results when people uh, going and do the program. And I'm thinking about a young lady who was sexually abused a few, several years in childhood. And she started the program and she left God when she was a child. Mm. She asked me a lot of times, where was God at that moment? Where was he? And she couldn't understand why I was a Christian. And I'm working with her now more than for a year, and she found God again. Amen. Amen. She was, the last time she was in a church, she was 13 or 14, and she went to church again. Mm. Yeah. So it's life changing for the people who are working with it. And it's, it's a very easy program. It's easy to use, it's a group, you have to learn to share our problems. I think that's the most difficult part of it. It is, isn't it? To be vulnerable, to be able to open up about uh, our difficulties. Now, tell us a little bit, because you had an interest in this. She, they went on, they translated this to the Dutch language, as you can see, the facilitator manual and the participant manuals. Tell us how this impacted your life. Why did you want this there? I had a life-changing um, experience also. I went to for the training in the UK and the health director at that moment in the Netherlands asked me to look if it was a program to be translated to Dutch. And I didn't have a problem. I was healthy. I was not addicted. I was as it was. But when I was following the training and I was working with the steps and translating, there was a life change. There are two parts in women's life you will not talk about and you will not share your age and your weight. And I don't tell you my age, but at that time I was overweighted. And I was working the steps and just saw that I was food addicted. That I had some problems I didn't like. You like food, you enjoy yeah. food, maybe yeah. too much. And, and you realized much. that there was something that maybe There was needed. something that was uh, caused that. I was working on myself with the steps and I've lost at that moment 20 kilos. Wow. 20 kilos Praise by God. being in the program. And Praise I had God. a relapse. I was suffering breast cancer two years ago mm. and I had a relapse. Mm. But through the steps, again, and I'm lost now more than 30 kilos. Wow. So it's life changing Amen. for the people who work with it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for sharing, Hanneke. Uh, how do you envision this helping the community, the city uh, there in, in where you are in, in Utrecht and other places? Yeah, we have three active groups. I'm working as a buddy for the, in the week with, with a woman. And we, the active group started in a Sabbath school. Mm. They planning an extra group for the people who want to share. Wow. And we want to share it because we know that the only reason we do this is that the only way is that God set us free. That's Amen. Right. Amen. Thank you so much. It's thrilling to hear this story and it touched my heart and life as we as a people of hope can share that with others. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Katya, right now, uh, what's next? So this is not the only program for addictions. Right. We actually have, many of you have heard of the Breathe Free 2 program, which is our Stop Smoking program. And I want to invite uh, uh, Marcia McEdward to come here also and share a little bit, because the Breathe Free 2 program uh, has been also revamped and it's been taken up by um, people from all over the world. In the case of Marcia, she is currently in the Middle East uh, North Africa Union. She's a nurse and she's one of the associate directors there 
for Health Ministries and in charge and responsible for bringing this program to uh, the community there. So, Marcia. I want a story. Yes. I want to hear a story. Let's hear a story. As you can see, the materials have been translated and contextualized for the community in the Middle East. So, tell us about a story. Well, I just want to mention that we have 1.1 billion smokers worldwide. Mm. And in the Middle East and North Africa, we have a lot of the countries that are the highest of smoking prevalence. In fact, Lebanon itself is the third highest smoker country per capita. Mm. And so we're right in the middle of where this is needed. Uh, so we praise God for the Breathe Free program. It really, um, we find it's a way that we can connect with people and really get to know them and help them to find hope and healing in their life. So I want to tell you a story. Uh, it comes from the Emirates, and uh, it's a 50, I'm sorry, 37-year-old Fatty is his name. And he started smoking at the age of five. He uh, picked up the cigarette butts from his home and started sneaking them around the corner and would smoke them. Uh, by the age of 10, he was smoking a pack a day with a friend because he had a little bit of money from his mom. And uh, then uh, when it came to 18, he was already smoking two packs a day and smoking marijuana. Mm. Fatty thought smoking would be a part of his whole life, and yet he didn't want it to be. So he tried himself to quit unsuccessfully. He would maybe go a day, but he couldn't continue it. So he's very discouraged about this. Um, so as we brought the program to the area, um, a group began to pray. And one of the people in the group knew Fatty because she worked with him. She says, let's pray for Fatty. Mm -hmm. Let's ask the Lord to bless him particularly. So uh, they began to pray for Fatty by name. And at that time, we found out later, he began to have these thoughts. I'd really like to quit smoking. I know it seems like it's going to be a part of my life forever, but if someone offers to help me quit, mm -hmm. I will accept. Mm -hmm. And he came to this conclusion just before his coworker asked him, would you come to our program we're going to have? That Immediately, <laughs> he said yes. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, so he came to the program, and it's a, uh, over three weeks uh, and it was one day at a time for him. It was not easy, but he had really good support. And uh, so sometimes they would even go running in the evenings. They would uh, um, spend a lot of time together as a group. And this really helped Fatty to take this one day at a time. And by the end of the program, he was smoke free. Wow. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. That's and he great. said to, to everyone, I can't believe this is real. My family doesn't <laughs> believe me. <laughs> they don't think I can do this. And you ask him now, and he's almost reached two years smoke-free at two this time. Two years smoke-free. Wow. Those of you who have worked with addictions know that there are oftentimes, you know, they may go smoke-free for a month, mm -hmm. two, three, but mm -hmm. it's not a lasting change. Right. Here, two years after, he still yes. smoke-free. And he says person. now, I feel like I've never smoked a day in my life. I don't want anything to do with tobacco. And I praise God for what he has done wow. through this program. Praise God. Do you have another story? Well, we do have a, a comment, a question mm -hmm. at the end of a recent program that an Arab was asking one of our facilitators. He says, what's the magic? And they sat down together and he had an interview and he says, what's the magic? I've been smoking for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. How come now I come to you and I've quit tobacco? How can that happen? <laughs> so our facilitator said, well, those who really want to quit it only takes a little nudge to get them started. Mm -hmm. But then the group support is what helps them to become tobacco-free as well as to learn how to live tobacco-free. But then he's pointed up. He said, it's God that gives you the strength That's right. to do this. That's right. yeah. so this is what yeah. uh, the Breathe Free program does in our Middle East and North Africa communities. Thank you so much for sharing. So Doug, as you can see, Lives are being transformed all over the world. There are resources available, and we pray that God will you continue to use people to be equipped and share that with their friends in their communities in cities around the world. Very good. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, Marcia. Let's. I invite you to stand up, and as you're applauding, as we uh, to take another quick stretch break. As we now invite our next. Um, um, Person, Dr. Torben uh, Berglund, and to give us a discussion about mind well, of how, we, as we're looking here with the theme of our conference, with your, your brain and your body, 
how can we uh, incorporate this program? Tell us, uh, Dr. Torman, what is this program that you're wanting to share? Well, uh, you may be seated. Thank you. For now, Mindwell, it's it's been a dream. Okay. Uh, it's been an idea that we've been working on for, say, the last three years, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of years ago, we walked around in St. Albans, England, and talked about it. That's right. Uh, but I'm excited now because now we're moving beyond just it being a dream and idea. Mm -hmm. uh, this fall, we're moving into. Uh, development production of mm. Mindwell as a comprehensive mental health resource for the church but also something that will be available freely for everyone wow. and um, we I think we are in a quite unique situation with a great opportunity because there isn't really that much out there mm. and definitely not for free Right. But this will be, this is a long-term project. I think this will keep me busy for years and hopefully <laughs> others too. Um, but what we're going to do is this, we're starting with an online resource uh, where people can go on their computer, on their app, uh, and go through sort of a self-guided uh, education on mm -hmm. like the fundamentals of what uh, is good mental health, what does it take to have good mental health. And one of the things as a psychiatrist, as a psychotherapist, when I was working clinically, one of the things that I was frustrated about was mm. that, well, I have all this knowledge myself, right. I have all these theories, but we don't have a tradition for actually sharing with mm. this with a pa patient right. who really needs it. Um, so this will be like taking the best uh, from psychology, from psychiatry, everything based, uh, saturated with our values and principles mm -hmm. and making it available to people so they can educate themselves uh, to understand themselves better. Uh, but not just this is not just for people with a mental health disorder. Right. Uh, this will also be, I think, a great resource for anyone who just wants to improve their quality of life when it comes to their mind, their mental mm. health, their relationships. Um, but also beyond that, if you are in a situation where you want to help others, mm. um, if you are a teacher, a pastor, even a health professional, I think this will be a great tool to, to go and, and learn more about mental health. Right, so maybe, uh, can we see the next slide? Tell us, where, where uh, are you planning to distribute this? Or, I mean, how are you making it available? Um, what, like, the, the first part of this um, uh, initiative program is to develop, like, an on online okay. tool uh, that will be available to everyone. Later on, we will, based on, on the material we have, all the media content, uh, we will develop into something you can do like in the church, a small group. Uh, we'll use this material to uh, have a book, that kind of things. But really like using modern ways of communicating. This online tool will not be a person standing in front of the camera and speaking. Right. We will have animation videos, we will have short films, people telling or telling people stories. Right. There will be self-assessment, quizzes. Uh, really an interactive tool mm. that people can do. So this, um, we are now in the design process of the logo. This is not the final logo, sure. um, but I just wanted to have something to show. <laughs> uh, we have a website address, it's right. mindwell.org. Uh, you can go, it, it tells more about uh, the Mindwell, the thinking behind it. Uh, unfortunately, somehow the Luma Linda uh, internet system blocks our website. I don't know why, uh, but it's, it's a temporary website we have right. now. Right. Uh, it's probably something on our side that, that it's not quite right yeah. with uh, some security certificates. Well, um, I think perhaps that at least during this uh, Sabbath school time, we want people to be present. So we don't want them to going to the website. Right? Fine, so yes. that way we can listen to uh, you know, your stories. Yes, but keep, keep an eye, like, uh, I would okay. recommend still go to the website. There's a sign up uh, for being, getting more information later. Right, so uh, when will that be available? Is there a timeline? There's a timeline. Okay. I wish I could say it's coming okay. All right. very soon. Soon, okay. Uh, this is an ambitious project yeah. and it's expensive um, and it will take time to really go through the development. What we are starting now, we're starting working on it. Hopefully, 
Our aim, our timeline, our plan is that early 2021 okay. we will release it. Uh, we'll have uh, plenty of resources on there, but then it will be a continual development, also adding more and more content also for the future. So this will be ever on growing. Board. That's right. That's so, right. but uh, hopefully by 2021, we may start releasing, releasing some parts of it uh, before that, making it available. But like the, the program itself, uh, probably more like 2021. Perfect. So as uh, health professionals or those watching online uh, or people like me as a pastor, how can, what message do you want to say to the Adventist family worldwide uh, about this new tool? Uh, you know, this has been the theme of our uh, conference here. So what message would you want to, uh, to say to the Adventist family worldwide about this tool? Well, I want this to be something, and I think it will be something that really challenges the mind, mm. but also reaches the heart right. of, of the individual. And uh, there's so much potential. Like, I think many people like you, as Adventists, and also the population in general, we are sort of fairly well educated on what mm -hmm. it means to be physically healthy. Right. My experience on when it comes to the mental health is that many people lack really sort of actually some of the mm -hmm. basics uh, that can really make a big difference. So this is not rocket science, what right. we're going to do, but still it's what providing this information, these models of thinking, mm -hmm. understanding, I think it can make a big difference. So I really hope that when, when it's available, that people can use it. And that's also, it's been a theme here. The more you understand about mental health, uh, the less the stigma problem, I think, will that's be. Right. So in order to deal with the stigma problem, we need to educate ourselves. So that's both a way to, to make, uh, or to be able to support all of us uh, better. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Torben, uh, for this uh, information, and uh, as well as it's a way that we as a people can hope can actually help not only our own family, but share that with our communities, our neighborhoods, our cities, and even the nations of the planet. So thank you so thank much. You.